What have we learned? Let's go over a few things, what we've learned. We looked at chapters 1 and chapter 2 as God warns Israel of judgment. And we learn this reality that sin will be judged. No matter what society says, no matter what they say, oh, this is acceptable, this is good, this is okay, whatever, God may have a different, completely different viewpoint, and He will judge sin. And so He calls men to repentance, and when He reveals sin, He wants you to confess it to Him that it may be taken away through the blood of Jesus Christ. There was destruction coming to Israel because of their sin. But God had also promised deliverance, that one day they would be delivered. And then in chapters 3 through 5, we saw this reality that sin does bring pain, but Jesus brings a promise. He's going to restore things. The very place of Jerusalem where the temple was and they gloried in that we're safe because we have the temple here. But sin would wreak havoc and that city would be destroyed. Well, that place would be restored one day in Jesus. And the very people who were living in rebellion, the Jewish people who were far from God and were doing their own thing, well, one day he would bring them back home to a place of restoration there. And, and then also the very things happening in the land, the leaders and the people that were doing things wrong and leading wrong uh, one day Jesus would come, the Messiah, and He would restore things. And so we saw that for the believer, there is always this hope of one day. One day, sin will be no more. One day, heaven will come. One day, you will see Jesus face to face. It's, it's not a fantasy. It's really a finality when it comes to the Lord. He will do that, His promise and in light of what God will do, we saw in chapter 6 last week what God wants from me. And we looked at those four things, that He wants me to, to hear His voice. He wants me to remember His heart and His past work for me. He wants me to obey His will, to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And He wants me to confess my sin and come into a fellowship with Him. But to ignore that would have just dire consequences because sin always destroys and so now we get into chapter 7, the last chapter, and Micah closes with this thought that Israel, though they failed miserably, God would come in and He would remind them that He hadn't forgotten them, that in a sense He still loves them, He hadn't forsaken them, and one day He would save them completely, not because of their efforts, but because of His heart and His plan. And so if there's one thing to take home this morning, it's this. God forgives me because of His character and promise, not because of my worthiness. And there's times when we have that battle, we think that we have to be worthy before we come before the Lord, that somehow I've got to clean up the mess first before I come into His presence. And, and God says, no, you come as you are. You are a mess, but I will be doing the cleansing, and I will be doing the purifying, and I will be doing the forgiving and make you a new person. And so the simple breakdown of this chapter, the first seven verses show us Micah's sorrow for Israel's sin. Verses 8 through 13 is Israel's confession and comforting hope in the Lord. And verses 14 through 20, God's forgiveness promised. So let's dive into this. Micah says in chapter 7, verse 1, Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruit, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat, of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires, the faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. Micah's view of Israel's spiritual state is like looking at a field that has been um, harvested, and all that's left is sticks and undesirable fruit. That's what he sees them. And as he looked at this, he says in verse 1, woe is me. He began to weep over the spiritual state he saw and all the things going on. He says, I, I don't find a, a godly man or a faithful man completely gone. An upright man is nowhere to be seen. We look around and all we see is people violently attacking each other. How can I rip off my brother? And it grieved his heart. It's a sad state of our society when it's like that. It breaks the heart of the godly man. 
I think about Jesus when he came into Jerusalem there on that Palm Sunday. We forget, but when he came in, after all the hosannas, he began to weep with tears because he longed for Jerusalem uh, to come into that relationship with him. He says, I've longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks underneath her wings, but you weren't willing to come, and therefore destruction was set against them. He wept. David says this in Psalms 12, verse 1, Help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. You see, it's the faithful, the upright, the godly man, I believe, that helps preserve a sinful society, our society from sin's destruction. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. And it's so important to have godly men and women in society because they become a, well, kind of a, a purifier. To have biblical uh, input and things that are established, and maybe even laws over the land that are uh, after God's heart and to govern, those are good things. We need that. It's not a matter of progression, but preservation. You see, so often you'll find that people say, well, you're, you're just old-fashioned or, or you get with the times. That's not the issue. The issue is sin is destroying a society and having that godly influence helps preserve it from an ultimate destruction that is coming. You're the salt of the earth and as salt is a preserver, it keeps out the bad stuff at times. Uh, we need to remember that. But when men are faithless and failing, we have to remember that God is still faithful. You know, after Jesus wept and looking over the city, he didn't give up his mission just because people weren't willing to accept him. He continually went to the cross. And so too, in the a, in a same pattern as you weep for what you see in your society, you weep for people around you that aren't walking with the Lord, but you keep looking to the Lord because he's the only hope and the only help. So Micah goes into more detail in verse 3 and, and 4. Look at what he says that they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts, and the judge seeks bribes, and the great man utters his evil desires. So they scheme together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their... Per, 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 I can't even say that word. Thank you. Perplexity. Princes and judges and the great man, which we referred to as the king, they were just scheming and ripping off others. In our day, we talk about corrupt government officials. Micah had it in their day, ripping off each other just to get what they can. And he says there that they're like a briar or a thorn hedge, just a painful poke and an irritation. Sounds familiar. But he says as watchmen, they should be watching for the enemy coming and they should be ready, but they weren't. And so when God sent this destruction, when he came to judge them, he says at the end of verse 4, now shall be their perplexity. It will stand perplexed. Isn't it interesting that when things are going well, we don't think about our sinfulness before God? It's when things fall apart. It's when things, you know, maybe discipline comes that we stand perplexed and go, wow, what happened? How did we get this far? Why did this happen to me? It's been said that Sin will take you farther than you want to go, take you to places you never meant to be, and cost you more than you were ever willing to pay. It ruins relationships. It ruins all kinds of things. But how do I respond when I see the sin destroying my life or those around me? Be grieved. Weep, as Micah did. It's a right response. But what do I do next? Well, look what Micah did. He went to the Lord in prayer, verse 5. Do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the door of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Things were so bad that you couldn't trust even your close friends and family, even your spouse, your wife. And we note that sin not only destroys a society, but it destroys relationships as well. How many of us have seen that, even as we look at our own families? I was reading an article recently that talked about 40% of families have some type of, of uh, 
not more than friction, a disconnection because of relational issues. 40%. I imagine that maybe it's even a little higher. But the reality is that sin destroys relationships, and it destroys family, and that's what was going on. But the hope is this, that while sin destroys, God restores. He not only restores a society, bringing them back to a civil righteousness, He not only uh, restores a nation that might have been attacked and disrupted by an enemy, as Israel would be, but He restores spiritually. He restores relationally. In fact, look at Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, the very last words of the Old Testament before Christ comes. And this, this was written 400 years before He came, holding on to this promise for 400 years. He says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And what will he do? He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. And and Jesus pointed out that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, pointing people to Jesus. He would be the one to restore relationships. He would be the one to to be the help that we need before the judgment falls. Interesting, when you look at the Old Testament, Genesis started off with what? A curse because of sin? And Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, ends up with a declaration regarding the curse of sin. It, It has its effect. God would come to restore. God would come to save. But because of how men were treating each other, look at what Micah says in verse 7. Therefore, I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. And if you have a pen, you might underline that, because how important that is. I will look, and I will wait. That God hears your prayer when you're in the midst of that situation and the sorrow from sin. He hears your cry for mercy. I am waiting for the God of my salvation. Interesting word in the Hebrew Those of you that have studied that word salvation, the Hebrew word uh, for salvation is actually yasha, where we get our word Yeshua, which was the name of Jesus, Yeshua. Jesus is Greek, Yeshua is Hebrew, that's what they called him. So he says, literally, I am waiting for Jesus. I am waiting for Jesus to come and to save us from our sin. I'm waiting and I'm looking for his coming. He came first to die for our sin. He's coming second to rule and reign in righteousness, as the Bible tells us. But what do I do when sin is destroying my world? Well, follow Micah's example. In verse 1, he wept over him. Woe is me. And then he began to pray to the Lord. He turned to the Lord about it for the people that he loved. And he began to wait on God, waiting for him to work. So knowing the God of salvation will come one day and restore them, what does Israel then tell, or Micah then tell the enemies of Israel around about their situations? Look at verse 8. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the street. What's he getting at? He basically says, Hey, don't rejoice. It's not over, and God's not done with me. And so often we need to remember that as well. It's the confession of a broken man, of a humble heart that is recognizing the confidence in God's ability and God's plan. Look at what he says again in verse 8, when I fall, I will arise. That's hope. That tells us that Israel would one day be restored. And we follow that same pattern is that when we fall, it's not the end of the world. It's not over with because God upholds us and God will strengthen us. We rise from the darkness into light, not because of our willpower and just pull ourselves up to do it, It's actually the Lord who is doing that. Psalms 43, David writes and says, Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me, Lord. And how important it is we recognize that. Lord, you pick me up. He says in verse 9 that I'm going to bear the indignation from the Lord. And a broken man does take responsibility for his sin. 
hey, I'm not casting the blame. I'm not making the excuses. I'm taking the responsibility to say, I have sinned. I will bear the indignation. And Israel was going to bear the consequences as the Assyrians would come in and wipe them out and take them captive. But they knew that one day God's righteousness would prevail and that God would uh, restore. You see, the divine season of chastening and judgment was to bring the people to repentance. And so too in your life and in my life, as sometimes God allows those hardships to happen, it may be to bring you to repentance. God works a good thing out of it. In verse 10, he says, My enemies will have shame cover her. These were the enemies that mocked and said, Where is your God in the midst of this? But they know in the end they're going to face his wrath. In the end, God sits on the throne. He sits on the throne while men and nations and enemies that attacked us are no more. Here's what's interesting. Where is the Assyrian Empire today? Where's the Babylonian Empire? They all thought, hey, where is your God? I know where my God is. He sits over all those things and puts you down. You're eating dust like a snake. He took care of the enemy. And that's what we stand in that confidence. But here's the, here's the reality. How do you and I respond when we spiritually fall and scrape our knees? Do we stay down in the dumpster, so to speak? We call it quits and say, you know what? I'm done with Jesus. I'm done with church. I'm done with Christianity because it's not working the way I thought. How could God allow this to happen in my life? Do we pass the blame? It's their fault for the way I am. Do we go into the self-pity party? All these things we can do. Or do we simply get back up? We take responsibility for our sin and our failure, confess it before the Lord, and keep moving forward in Christ. Listen to what Psalms 37 says, verse 23 and 24. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. You see, your response after you fall is crucial in determining your future. Let me give you two examples. We know these two guys really well. Comparing Peter with Judas. Both of them made a tremendous failure, right? A tremendous blunder regarding Jesus. But there was two different, conse- or two different outcomes in it. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he went into isolation. When Peter denied Jesus, where did he go? He went back to the company of believers. Though he couldn't figure it out, though he was down and discouraged, he said, these are my peeps. Judas went out and hung himself. Peter, in a sense, just hung in there, exercising patience, trying to figure it all out, and had that conversation with Jesus until finally Jesus restored him. Here's the kicker. The difference? Foundation. Your world will get rocked at times. The storms will come. And what is at the foundation? Is it on the rock of Christ or is it the sandy land of religiosity? It was Peter who said in John chapter 6, when everybody else was leaving, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I have believed and come to know you're the Holy One of God. It says, whenever things fall apart, when I see, don't understand what's happening, I'm just going to stand on this foundation. You are Christ. You've got this. I don't know. Or will I respond like the others? Man, that's a tough saying. You know what he said to him? You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Whoa, we don't do that. See you later, Jesus. I'm not talking literal. That's what, you know, that's what he went on to say. But when your world gets rocked, when sin comes in and does a number, when God allows that distance in your life from him, it's a test of your foundation. Will you stand upon Jesus and what you know to be true when you're faced with the future of what you don't know is going to happen? Judas took matters into his own hands Peter, just in humility in a sense, bowed before the Lord and said, here I am. Lord, you know. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. Go feed my sheep. Foundation. Judas never had anything good recorded of him. And when your faith is tested, the foundation is revealed. 
The enemy wants to keep you down. He wants to tell you you're no good. He wants to tell you that God's done with you. You might as well throw in the towel. And yet the Spirit of God comes along and says, hey, buddy, you blew it. You messed up. Israel, you made a mess. Confess it, forsake it, come right back on track, and let's keep going forward. As we've said before, Satan will always drive you from God while the Spirit of God pushes you toward him. How do I know if this is really Satan or if this is really the Spirit of God? Well, who's it leading you toward? Do you think Satan's going to go, get to Jesus, man, he just loves you so much, he wants to forgive you? No! You think your flesh is going to tell you that? No, your flesh is going to say, hey, you blew it there, let's go try something else. But the Spirit of God, He may poke you at times. He may convict you, but He will always lead you to Jesus to restore you. That's the beauty of grace. That's the beauty of this relationship with the Lord. So who are you listening to? The confession of sin in verses 8 through 10 now leads to the comfort from the Savior in verses 11 through 13. Here's His promise. In that day when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree shall go far and wide. In that day they shall come to you from Assyria and the fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, from sea to sea and mountain to mountain. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. In that day was the return from captivity when they came back. Remember Nehemiah. There during that time, during the the walls were restored and rebuilt, as verse 11 talks about. The people that were scattered everywhere came back home in verse 12. And the land, though it was ravished for 70 years, it would be a reminder to the Jews of what sin does. It destroys. And yet we can see a future day coming when the Bible tells us in that day God will restore Israel, that they will look on the very one they pierced and will begin to mourn as they, as they weep for the death of a firstborn because they realize He was the Messiah that they rejected, and yet God's heart never changed for them. He hadn't forsaken Israel even today. He hadn't forgotten Israel even today. His plan still stands. He will be a God who forgives. And what will they find in this new relationship with God through Jesus? Well, let's read on. Verse 14, intimacy with God. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitary in the woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead. Those are very fertile plains, as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders So he talks about intimacy with God, his closing prayers. Lord, we just shepherd the people. Like the days long ago in Egypt when you you provided for them and you did these wonders and you cared for them. May there be this intimacy and this closeness because of this new relationship in Jesus that we have. Am I seeing the same thing in my relationship with Jesus? It should grow in knowing him. There should be an intimacy You see, the relationship with God is not just about what He's done. Yes, He's given me a position. He calls me His child. Yes, He's given me heaven. Yes, He's given me eternity. It's way more than that. It's not about what I get from God. It's what I cultivate with God. And He's brought me into His family, into a relationship with Him that I can have fellowship with my Creator. And it radically changes our lives. Intimacy with God is found in this new restored relationship. And it also, we see victory from God. Verse 16, the nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might, and they shall put their hand over their mouth, their ears shall be deaf, they shall lick the dust like a serpent, they shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth, they shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you. The enemy nations that taunted Israel in verses 8 through 10 are now uh, shrinking back in in humility and in, in fear as they're terrorized as God has restored these people, the Israelites. It says there in verse 17, they shall fear because of you. God put them in their place, just crushing them in defeat. And I think even as believers, we should see victory in our life. We should see victory over issues of of the flesh, over issues of the pressures of the world, over the uh, satanic attacks and things like that that happen. You should see victory in your life. So ask the Lord to show you those things. But seeing God's mercy upon Israel, Micah gives one more thing. 
In this restored relationship, we find praise to God, verses 18 through 20 tell us. We find intimacy with God, we find victory from God, and we find praise to God. Of all that God has done, he says, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Remember the name Micah means who is like Jehovah. So it's kind of a play on words here where he says, who is a God like you? There is no one who compares to our God. Why? Because, well, he forgives. He pardons iniquity. And iniquities are all those perversities and faults and moral evils. It's just often a general sins that we do. But then he also lists transgressions, and those are those willful sins of rebellion and uh, uh, a moral willful disobedience. That no matter what I've done, it does, never changes who he is. And we think, well, why does he do this? Well, read on. Because it says there, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He delights in mercy. It's not because we're so deserving. It's not because he owes us anything. Simply out of his heart. He delights in showing mercy, or as some translations say, compassion. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for that is is, uh, raham, and it means to love from the womb. That it's a picture of a, of a, a mother who loves her own helpless child, a deep emotional association that's attached to this. In other words, God looks at his people and he says, man, they're so helpless, but I love them. And I want to show them mercy. And I want to show them compassion. But understand this, the reason why he does that is because justice has been met towards our sin at the cross. He doesn't just willy-nilly just say, oh, I just want to be merciful because no big deal. He says, no, the cross took care of the sin so I can lavish you with mercy. And that's a beautiful thing for us. Look at verse 19. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's cool. God doesn't hold your sins over your head to shame you when you get out of line. He doesn't store them away to pull them up when, well, you've had a bad day and let me remind you how bad you are. It's as if he says, I am casting your sins into the deepest part of the ocean and putting up a sign, no fishing ever. Now, of course, I had to look and say, what is the deepest part of the ocean? Do you know that in the Pacific Ocean, the deepest part is seven miles deep, 35,000 feet. That's a lot of fishing line. Don't take it with you. But look at what else the Bible says about what he deals with our sins. Psalms 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. And you've heard it. If you go north, eventually you'll hit south because that's how it works. But if you go east, you will never catch up to west. You will always be going east. And so he knew what he was writing when he wrote that down. He said, you will never catch your sin. God has put it away. Uh, Isaiah 38, 17, he puts our sins behind his back. Jeremiah 31, 34, he chooses to remember them no more. And Acts 3, 19, upon believing and confessing your sins, it is blotted out. And the point that I'm making is it's not by your works, it's his. You confess it, he does the rest. Titus 3, 4 through 6, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared... He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our problem is that so often we sit back and we say, yeah, but I, I get that, but my situation's different. My situation's unique. You don't understand the sin that I've done. I understand that God God could forgive you, but not me. And we go on and on until we just level ourselves in condemnation. The problem is, if you're in that case, your eyes are too focused on who you are and the wrong that you've done and not the greatness of what God can do. It's not about you and what you've done. If God can save a thief on the cross next to him, who happened to, by the way, be a murderer and did nothing to earn his salvation but say, Lord, remember me when I come into your kingdom. If God promised him salvation, he can promise you salvation too by simple faith in his finished work. 
And so we rely upon that. He does the promising of new life, not me. He shows the kindness and saves, not me. He does it. I simply receive it and enjoy it. It's like a kid at Christmas, really, literally, as we get into that season, a kid at Christmas with a brand new bike. You realize as a kid when that happened to you, you didn't try to figure out how it all worked. You didn't have to know how to change sprockets and tubes and all that stuff. You didn't even care about the cost of it. All you knew was that you were gifted something and you just went out in your PJs, hopped on your bike and flow with the wind. And the neighbors didn't go, oh my goodness, did you see that kid out there? He's in his pajamas riding around on a bicycle. They knew it's Christmas and that kid is just enjoying the gift that was given to him. And we have that same mentality. God has been so gracious to me. He offers me forgiveness. Why can't I just jump in on it and just enjoy the ride in my pajamas? I don't have to get all fancy and earn it. No, it was given as a gift. I don't have to beat myself up as somehow I've got to deserve it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Don't be embarrassed because you're, you're, just, you're excited that God has forgiven you or that God has been so gracious in how He's blessed in your life. You don't have to hold it back. That's the work of the Lord. Now, if you get jealous because someone else, how God's working in their life, then yeah, deal with it. You got a problem. Confess it and move on. But it's the mature believer that can go, hey man, tell me how God's blessed you. Oh man, I got a bike for Christmas. Whew. Took out that Harley, run, run, run. Sweet, I don't have to be jealous. Like, you got a Harley? All I got was a skateboard. You know, you know I don't have to be jealous because I serve a God who, who blesses men. And he's a good God. Verse 20 as we close. He says, you will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. You see, he takes them back to the truth to live by and the promise to hold on. It all went back to Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants. Genesis 15, 22. He says, I'm going to bless you and your descendants after you. And God was faithful to his word even these thousands of years later. He is still faithful. He's made a promise to you and I as well. Psalms 89, look at this, 33, 34. I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Isn't that good to know? I'm in, I'm in this amazing covenant established in Jesus' blood that forever seals me for heaven and his family. That I can serve the God of mercy and hope and knowing that justly he deals with my sin. I don't have to sit back in shame. I can go forward in victory. And though we fall, we can rise back up because the hand of the Lord is upon us. Micah is such a beautiful book as we look at the failure, but we look at the follow-through of the Lord. We look at how sin destroys, but we see how God restores. Sin brings the pain, Jesus brings the promise. And that's the beauty of even the Bible and the gospel message is it points out our failures and our sins, but it always leads us to the solution in Jesus. So Micah does a great job in a sense of telling the people at that time, look, you're a mess, but God's not done with you. And you may be a mess this morning, and you need to know God's not done with you either. He sent his son to die for your sins and rose again that you may have everlasting life and victory. And so accept him into your life. If you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity. Accept him into your life, surrender it at his feet, and let God be Lord of your life. Let's pray.